The Science of Running, Coaches' Theories, Tuesday Lectures, The Loins. Genesis and Adam and Eve, a very short stack of underwear, question and answer, nothing about the human body is embarrassing, five or six. The science of the human body, when pushed to its limits, is beyond complex. I used the term oxygen debt before. In checking myself, I discovered in the literature on the science of such things that the term is actually incorrect. The answer to why a runner's muscles seize up like an old car engine sands oil when he or she pushes too hard may seem simple. The muscles aren't getting enough oxygen to function. Yet the truth is not so simple. There's something to that explanation, but at least as far as the scientists say, that ain't all of it. The rest of it I couldn't understand. And I have a sneaking suspicion neither could most of the scientists. Go into any running store and you'll discover shelves somewhere burdened with training manuals and guides, and they all to some degree feel the need to explain what the training they suggest will do to the runner's body. Many of these explanations you'll discover if you dig in and read and compare one to the others are contradictory. The basics are pretty clear. But get into the finer points about the best way to train a human being to run a certain distance as fast as possible, and you'll find a lot of different answers. Well, Coach ignored all those different answers and bought into almost none of those scientific explanations. I've never met a coach, in fact, who cared less about what the authorities said, but he did have many theories of his own. Coach didn't believe in stretching before or after a run. He always said, if the cat don't stretch before it chases the mouse as if that settled it. He didn't believe in hard and easy days. He said that was only for swimmers. He never explained why swimmers would need hard and easy days when runners wouldn't, as I once asked him. It seemed to me the two sports were pretty similar. Also, he didn't believe in treating injuries. He felt that any injury, if the runner simply gimped through it, would ultimately clear itself up. He believed in the human body's mysterious healing powers almost without exception. And he believed that having sex during periods of competition was disastrous to performance. Judging from the way he talked to us, a bunch of nerdy, stinky, greasy teenage boys, many of whom wouldn't even kiss a girl until, until we were old enough to register for the draft, he believed we all had the option of having sex nearly all the time. During the season, Coach lectured on Tuesdays. On Mondays, he gave us Xerox copies of his obsessively scribbled notes concerning our Saturday races, which he wrote on Sundays. They were so detailed, with each runner's splits, and so many thoughts jotted down on race strategy that I imagined it took him most of the day to write them. He expected us to read them on our own and pointed out only one or two things he'd found particularly interesting and useful before our Monday workout. On Tuesdays, however, we learned to expect to settle in on those old wooden benches down in our moldy locker room for at least half an hour, while Coach expounded on whatever running-connected theme he'd decided upon. This, whispered Bowden into my ear when we sat down that second Tuesday in September after the Hokum Carum, is the one we all wait for. He nodded at the freestanding chalkboard at the head of the U, a poorly drawn yet still recognizable outline of the human body filled the middle of the chalkboard. An arrow was drawn to the groin area and the word LOINS was written beside it in all capitals. It was pretty clear that Coach was fired up and on point as soon as he walked into the room, a piece of white chalk in his hand. I am in charge of several aspects, he started, using language I noted that was slightly elevated compared to his normal slang-laden chatter, of your training. He was wearing his owlish glasses, too. Yet, there are many aspects of your lives that I cannot control as much as I would like. You're in my hands only for a short time before school each day when you get your run in, and then from three till five afternoons on school days. Saturday mornings are for racing. The rest of the time is your own. Now, he began pacing back and forth, head down, pushing his glasses up on the bridge of his nose when they slid down. What you do in all that time I'm not looking over your shoulder is your own business. But there's some things you gotta do if you wanna be a great athlete. And, he paused for effect and made meaningful eye contact with us, there's some things you oughtn't do. Here it comes, whispered Bowden. He was grinning. The male loins, said Coach, pointing at his drawing, which looked like the body outline of a murder victim at a crime scene. 
are the source of much power. Yost, that sour senior, was sitting next to Squid. He must have arrived late and found other seats available. He nudged Squid in the ribs, and when he did, Squid had to cover his hand with his mouth to keep from laughing. It was one of the few times Chad Yost acted like a genuine friend to anyone on the team. The fact that it was Squid made it all the more surprising. The loins of a man, Coach went on. Some believe constitute the physical beginnings, the genesis, one might say, of the entire universe. He stopped talking for a moment and tapped the chalk-drawn arrow on the blackboard. Look, if you'd like, at the Bible when you go home today. You'll find in the book of Genesis, and he raised a finger to emphasize the use of the word Genesis, how uncanny it was that he'd only moments before used the word himself, the story of Adam and Eve, which is the story from which we learn how the human race began. Popeye looked at Leonardo Chavez next to him. His squinty eye always made him look skeptical anyway. What's he talking about? He whispered loudly. Leonardo, his brown face, the blank slate it always was during Coach's lectures, shrugged. The power of the human race, continued Coach. Then he pounded once with his fist on the groin area of his drawing, is in the loins. His face lit up as if he'd made a great connection, a brilliant flash of insight right then and there on the spot. The power of your race, he said, is in your loins. Very satisfied with the poetry he'd spun out for us. This is when my brother raised his hand. He had been so good those first few weeks of school. He smoked it on Angel Devil. He wore the clothes I'd asked him to. He didn't get caught on that first day of school, morning practice when we'd been chased across town, and he'd run a strong hokum carom. I was beginning to think high school had changed him. I soon found out it hadn't. Coach was surprised to see a hand in the air, but welcomed any questions. K2, he said, what's on your mind? Well, Hyder began, you say the power of the human race comes from the loins. Hearing him use the word loins caused my head to drop. I stared at my own loins, waiting for him to shut up. And then you talk about how the human race came from Adam and Eve, but wasn't Eve made with a rib, according to the Bible? Coach thought about that. Then he simply tapped on the blackboard in the area of the groin. The loins, he said, with an air of finality. And thankfully that shut Hyder up for a little while, but not for good. Now, the same power that creates human beings and makes the world go round is the power you use when you run a race. Coach raised his hands as if expecting contradictions. Now I know it's the legs and heart that we train every day. It's the legs and heart that matter most when it comes to distance running, but... And he tapped the blackboard again, right where his outline drawing's balls would have been, and Victor groaned, causing Slade to chortle. The next most important aspect of racing is the loins. Coach paused then. It must have been an overly long pause because I thought for some stupid reason that we were done. I thought the lecture was over, and I was glad. It had been embarrassing to sit there and edge around the the subject of sex when I had not come within shouting distance of any act with a girl that might be categorized as even remotely related. I'm sure Popeye and Leonardo were in silent agreement with me on that. What was worse was that I'd only recently been having issues at home very secret issues, which had to do with my loins, a part of my body I couldn't seem to control at that particular time in my young life. Where are all your underwear? My mother had innocently, but a little too loudly, asked just the week before, as our entire family sat in front of the television. She was folding my brother's and my clothes and putting them on the living room table in front of her, making a stack for my brother and a stack for me. Hyder's pile of tidy whities was about seven or eight pair deep. My stack of boxers, I insisted on this difference, it grossed me out to think I might be wearing his underwear, so I chose to wear a style that would ensure my undergarments were not confused with his. Wasn't a stack at all. It was one pair. All the others I'd clandestinely thrown down the sewer grate in front of our house in the darkness of early morning. Nocturnal emissions were what my junior high health teacher had called them. Nearly every night I was having a wet dream. While my teacher had assured us that these were natural occurrences, nothing to be ashamed of, I couldn't help but look at my soiled underwear as a sign of depravity on my part. 
Each pair reminded me of the filthy, sometimes bizarre dreams that ended up in a pair of soiled jockeys. So every morning I woke to find my boxers wet, I'd slip them off and stuff them under my bed. Then, on some pre-dawn morning during the week, I'd get up and sneak outside and throw all that condemning evidence down the sewer grate in front of our house and into the sewer below. The guys at the water treatment plant must have wondered what was going on after about a year of this. To my mother's question about the location of all my underwear, I stuck with that tried-and-true lie. The best of all lies in its utter vagueness and impossibility to prove false. I said, I don't know. My mother, the best mother on earth, I believe, didn't ever confront me about my underwear again. She must have bought me about 50 pair that fall and winter. But back to Coach. The lecture was not over. The lecture had just begun. Now, Coach said, erasing with his open palm, his drawing arrow, and the word loins. The power is in the loins, but one can be more specific. Can anyone tell me? Coach put his now white and dusty hand behind his back where, in particular, the power that resides in the loins is. Victor raised his hand. Coach nodded at him. The dick, said Victor. No, not the dick. Anyone else? Slade raised his hand. Coach nodded at him. Jeff? The nuts, said Slade. Exactly, said Coach, smiling at his prized student. Trung leaned over and offered Slade a congratulatory handshake, which Slade graciously accepted. The power of the loins resides more specifically in the nuts, said Coach. And what do we call that power that is in its, in its most elemental form? Nobody raised his hand for a moment. Swart's shoulders were hitching up and down. He was trying so hard not to laugh out loud. Victor raised his hand again, willing to give it another shot for the team. Victor again, said Coach. Coach, said Victor, a confident look on his face, I think you're referring to come. Come, said Coach. He smiled. That's right, come. Also known in the scientific community as semen. At this, Swart, who was sitting next to Bowden, let loose a loud bark. He then tucked his chin down hard against his chest. His entire body vibrated subtly on the bench seat in his effort not to explode with laughter. His trapped laughter was contagious, however, and Bowden's too soon had his face covered with his arm. Semen is a magical substance that can both produce babies and win races, said Coach, seemingly oblivious to the silent laughter that had taken over the room. The evidence is clear. The greatest warriors and athletes have always known it. For example, the Spartans of ancient Greece were not allowed to be around women leading up to battle. Boxers, including the greatest himself, Muhammad Ali, would not and do not have sex before fights. This is because the semen contains the substance that makes the, us men hungry. It's the stuff that brings out the competitor and conqueror in us. Coach glanced around the room, swart and bound, and pulled themselves back together during this explanation. So here's the deal. No sex for any of you during the season. I glanced at Popeye and Leonardo Chavez. Popeye, I was pretty sure, would still enjoy playing with his G.I. Joes more than being confronted with a girl. Leonardo looked like he was about 11. I didn't think the no-sex rule was going to be too tough on them. Or on me, either, for that matter. Okay, everyone raise your hand now. We're making a team pledge. We all raised our hands. Repeat after me, said Coach. He scowled. Get your hand up, Victor. When he was sure everyone's hands were in the air, Coach began. I promise, I promise, we replied. Not to have sex, Coach said. Not to have sex, we all chanted. Until after the season, he finished. Until after the season, we all said. Coach clapped his hands together. All righty then, that was good. I thought we were done for real then, and we would have, we would have been if it not had been for my brother. The whole team was standing, shaking hands on their bargains made. Coach was pushing the blackboard out of the way. We were done. Then I heard Hyder's voice. I knew I ought to make a run for it right then. Coach, he said. Coach! At the sound of his insistent voice, everyone stopped what they were doing. The noise stopped. All eyes were on Hyder. Yeah, K2, what is it? What about masturbation? I remembered our health teacher again, a hippy-dippy lady named Miss Teague. 
She always had a smile on her face, wore a pair of half glasses, and loved to talk about sex. Everything she said about sex was natural and good. The human body, she said, was perfect. What it did was simply what nature intended it to do, and it was only the strictures of human culture, the stultifying shame-creating rules that human beings made up arbitrarily that made us so embarrassed by what our bodies did, were, and looked like. Nothing was cause for embarrassment but the prudish way people went about being ashamed of themselves for doing things that were natural. Well, Heider took her at her word. I guess he assumed everyone in the room had had Miss Teague for health and felt the same way she did, because when he brought up the subject of masturbation in that room full of high school guys, he didn't seem to have a clue that he might be setting himself up for some serious mockery. What'd you say? said Coach, although I'm pretty sure he'd heard Heider. I think he just couldn't believe what he'd heard had been what Heider had actually said. I said, what about masturbation? Can we masturbate? At this, Sword, who had been on the edge since he'd seen that word loins written on the board, began laughing so hard he couldn't stand. He simply sat down cross-legged on the concrete floor of the locker room and shook. Coach, ignoring Swart, thought about it. How much are we talking about, K2? Like once or twice a week? Hyder considered it for a moment. My heart stopped. I thought about it and realized that recently, when we were at home, Hyder was often nowhere to be found. Sometimes in the middle of dinner, he would ask to be excused and return after a few minutes. And this was normal, it seemed, except for the fact that he always used the upstairs bathroom near our bedrooms and not the one right next to the dinner table. And just that Sunday, I needed to go to the bathroom myself two or three times over the course of the day and had been surprised the third time in a row to find that Hyder was always in there. But I hadn't made any suspicious leaps, not anyway, until I saw the look on Hyder's face as he computed his answer to Coach's question. A steam whistle in my head was silently screaming while everyone on the team anxiously awaited his response. Five or six, he finally said. Five or six times a week, Coach replied. I could tell he was amazed that Hyder was running as well as he was with all that energy lost. Five or six times a day, said Hyder, without a hint of embarrassment. I was pretty sure we were going to have to call the paramedics to come and get Swart from off the floor. He was howling so hard I was certain he must have hurt himself. Coach took his glasses off and stared at Hyder in amazement. Son, he said, I'm amazed you even have the energy to stand up. And for this incredible embarrassment, I did not blame my brother. I blame my coach.